Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you here on behalf of the Melbourne School of uh, Engineering. I'm Robin Batterham, I'm the Curnow Professor of Engineering uh, here at Melbourne, uh, and I'm delighted that so many of you uh, registered and turned up. Um, we, we wondered whether we should do the airline booking stunt and overbook um, a few percent, 20 percent uh, or whatever. Um, but in the end I see that you're all comfortably seated, so we obviously got that one right. Now what I hope uh, that we can do tonight uh, is, uh, and I'm sure we will, is listen uh, to three very eminent speakers that we've lined up, then we'll have a question time. So unless the question is of the nature, please I can't hear you, um, save the questions uh, until the end and there'll perhaps be um, um, nothing much to say about questions other than uh, they do need to be questions, not statements of position. So to start, to, that's just in joyful anticipation. Um, <laughs> to start with, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome the Dean uh, of Engineering here, uh, Professor uh, Evan Mariels, and he's going to kick off with the uh, first talk. He is actually uh, quite qualified to uh, talk to us on the uh, subject uh, because he's perhaps one of the rare beasts amongst us who's actually uh, studied and practiced uh, nuclear uh, power engineering. Uh, he's very decorated in terms of uh, science and technology with publications, with books, with fellowships of academies. He's on uh, been advisor to, uh, dare I say, numerous uh, boards. Um, for those of you that like to go into detail, I'm not going to stand and read uh, what is an ex quite an extraordinary CV. That's what Google is for. You go off and do the work yourself. <laughs> so let's welcome, please, uh, Professor Evan Muriels. Thank you, Robin, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to, to talk a little bit about Fukushima and facts and fallout. What we're trying to do, the three of us, basically myself, Jeff, and Priyan, will be to try to decipher some of the facts that are out there and put them in a context of engineering. So, we've already heard about Robin, that's me. And so I'm going to first talk a little bit about Japan, the reason of all the earthquakes and why it has chosen so much of nuclear power, and a little bit about reactor basics, so what is a boiling water reactor and how does it actually work, and then a little bit of an overview of the timeline of the accident and what it actually entails for us. So Japan is an, is an ice island, as we know. It, uh, it's placed on a very unfortunate position in the world, if you like. It, it lives on three different plates. Uh, this is the North American plate. Uh, this is the, South, the European, uh, European plate. This is the Filipino plate, and this is the Pacific plate. And all these tectonic plates are actually merging together. They are on a convergent trajectory. And as a consequence, we have an awful lot of earthquakes in Japan. Japan has chosen for a lot of nuclear power. As you can see, all these little red balloons are the places where you will find the nuclear power stations in Japan, all around the coast, all close to water where you would expect them to find them, but also all very close to tsunamis and earthquakes. Um, Japan has 120 million people. Remember that number will be something quite important. The area is only 50% larger than Victoria, and yet its coastline is about 20% larger than that of Australia. So it has an awful lot of places to put things at the coastline and not so much inland. And then uh, we know that on March the 11th, basically, we had this, this big earthquake, a nine point on the Richter scale, just off the coast of Japan, about 150 kilometers away from Fukushima. And 50 minutes later, a tsunami basically hit that particular facility, and the tsunami is estimated as being a height of 14 meters, which is very large by any consideration. The facility was only built for six meters, not for 14. The electrical power capacity of uh, Japan is around 240 gigawatt installed power, 
uh, 120 million people, six times more than Australia. That's roughly the same number as what we would have in Australia per capita. So it's roughly the same type of development of their economy as ours, basically. Thermal leaf, classic thermal mean coal, oil, gas, 179 gigawatts. So the majority of all the gas, basically of all the power is generated the classical way with lots of carbon dioxide associated with it. The nuclear power part is 49 gigawatts, and as a consequence, they're about the fourth largest operator of nuclear power plants in the world. The particular plant we are talking about, Fukushima, produces about 4.7 gigawatt electric. That's about 10% of their total capacity in nuclear power, 2% of total capacity. Uh, one of the, the things you will find in, in the Google website is that this is the end of power uh, for Japan, while well, 2% they have lost in their capacity, even if the whole of Fukushima is taken out, and also only half of that is taken out. Wind and solar are particularly small, still 4 gigawatt for wind and solar, hydro about 8 gigawatt, and the hydro is not a typical hydro, it's more storage hydro and pumping hydro, so they're pumping it up, storing it there, and then using it later on when, the, uh, when they have a shortage, basically, in peak power. From the 54 operating nuclear power plants, there were 55, there are only 54 left, there are still 12 in planning phase and 2 in the building phase. So the whole trajectory that Japan is on is actually increasing its nuclear power capacity and the estimate in their forward planning is that by 2050, roughly 50% of all the power in Japan would be delivered through nuclear. Severely decreasing the amount of coal and gas and uh, classical thermal, increasingly also more wind and solar. But in the end, they're still predicting that even if they do everything as fast as they possibly can, they will need about 50% nuclear to meet demand. A 9.0 earthquake, when you compare it with an 8.0 earthquake, and I use it as a reference because that's what the plant was designed for. But what is a 9? Well, it's a logarithmic scale, meaning that at 9.0, we have about 10 times more amplitude in motion than at an 8. In energy terms, you're looking at 30 times more. So it's a significantly larger event than what you normally would think at an 8 could happen. So the difference between the design conditions and the actual conditions are fairly large. Now, distance plays a role in everything else, but nevertheless, this is the fifth largest event is recorded that we know in the last 200 years. The consequences of, the, of that fact are significant and horrific. More than 10,000 people are declared dead. There are another 10,000 missing, with more than half a million people basically without homes. And a conservative estimate recently came out, suggests that Japan will need about $300 billion to repair whatever has been damaged. Now, that's roughly 6% of GDP of Japan, and again, very much in coordinates with ours, that would take 30% of Australia's GDP to pay that out. So this is a massive uh, disaster basically for uh, Japan. Most of this damage was not due to the earthquake. If you look at the pictures, most of the homes stood quite well up to this eight, the 9.0 earthquake, but it was the tsunami that basically flooded and, and basically destroyed everything. Same thing for the plant. But now let's have a look a bit at the Fukushima reactor. It's a boiling water reactor. It's one of the first generation reactors designed by General Electric. Uh, there are not many in operation anymore. This plant was 40 years old at the time of the disaster. It would have probably had a lifespan left of about 10 years for normal design life, and they may have pushed it a little bit for asking an extension. That won't happen, of course, but um, 40 years is very much close to the design lifetime. Uh, Fukushima 1 here, the picture for that, it's, it's a, a plant with about 440 megawatt electrical output. That means that the thermal output of this plant is 1.5 gigawatt. So it's roughly three times larger because the efficiency, thermal efficiency, at the, the temperatures that these things operate is roughly around 30%. If you shut this thing down, it will still produce roughly between 3 and 6% of its full thermal capacity, which means in this case that somewhere between 50 and 75 megawatt will be produced, and for a fairly long period of time as well. If everything goes well, it takes about 20 hours to cool this thing down to roughly reasonable conditions. And that's under perfect conditions. It's a very simple plant. Basically, you have a big boiler, in this case, fat nuclear, water comes in, steam will leave, 
will go through a turbine which will then produce electricity. The steam is cooled in a condenser and then fed back into the loop in order to be reheated, etc. The control is very simple. It's essentially either uh, uh, some control rods or actually the void in the, the steam void in the reactor itself. Very basic design. A few things.